All right, episode 97 today, we are going to be talking about... Nick, you sound different this week. A lot different. My microphone's actually plugged in. 97, we're talking about how agents are winning in this market. Let's get started right now. Welcome to the only real estate podcast worth listening to with your hosts, Nick Good, Matt Kelderman, and Brian Force. Combined, they have 26 years of experience and have sold over 1,500 homes. Join them each week as they bring you everything you need to know about real estate. Oh, episode Whoa. 97. We're coming in Sneak hot. attack. Yes. yes. All right, episode 97. Today, we are going to be talking about how real estate agents are setting themselves up to win in this competitive marketplace that we're all experiencing. It's not very fun right now. Yeah, it's all about perspective, right? That's not very fun. Right <laughs> yes. it's not, no. All right, that's no, fair no. enough. But if this is your first time listening, tuning in, watching, wherever wherever you're consuming this content right now, not go wrong. over go over to Facebook to the only real estate group worth being a part of. Go request access in there. Come share what's working in your real estate business and uh, add other real estate professionals to this, as well as go over to iTunes, subscribe, download, listen to the episodes there, and leave us a five-star review, please. And so today I want to talk about um, you know, kind of piggybacking off of off of some of our, our most popular episodes, right? So if we really look at some of our most popular episodes, it's been uh, Johanna. Jo- Johanna? Johanna. Johanna? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Johanna? I don't just, know why you're trying to force Joanna. that H so hard. I don't know. Do you say Johan? You My say niece's yes, name is Johan. I misspelled the exact yeah. name. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Okay. That, that's how it was said. Well, I'm sorry then. But <laughs> hers was how she did 18 deals in her first 90 days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And then last week's episode, episode 96, we had on uh, Nate, who talked about how he did 10 million in his first 12 that was months. That's super fun. I miss Nate. I know. Yeah. Really. You know, uh, Nate had a great, by the way, Nate, he's tuning in right now. I know. <laughs> I'm right? Hello, Nate. So when you see Nate again, just ask him how the rest of his night went. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, I feel like we were partially responsible alone. for that. Leave that poor man alone. <laughs> you know, what people don't know, <laughs> I'm sure you can hear that there's sometimes Squish. some beverages that's Dude, we're, being We're open. off the clock, bro. And uh, Nate had a couple of beverages, too couple. many. couple. And um, the rest of his night was, he was having a good time. Squish. Hey, he made a lot of great points, and I liked having him on. Yeah, so you know, in this real estate market, I know let, let's you know let's relate to our marketplace here in the Dallas Fort Worth area and Collin County. If you take if you take just Collin County uh, numbers alone, with new and pre-owned combined, there's 0. 0.9 months of inventory. Yeah, right. There was a thousand total homes available, right? And so when you go look at this, I know that we we've, we've started to have clients that are experiencing their frustrations and and really letting it out on us where you know they're one of 96 offers yeah yeah it's it's it it's fucking crazy on the buy side right i get that so like if we're talking about first of all i love this new camera have you can you see on facebook my i look like darth brian it's very cool um if you're (laughs) no lady's laughing um on the buy side, look, it just is what it is. You can make it, part of it is being skilled, like Kelderman is getting people under contract because he just kind of knows what to do and, and how this all works. And even with that level of talent, there's still a little bit of a crapshoot. Look, when there's 96 offers on the table, like we've heard things like that happening, Kelderman just put it perfectly. He's like, no matter how good you are, you still only have a 2% chance of getting that offer accepted. Yeah, I mean, just the sheer volume of some offers. I, like, I have this really great perspective of the market that's unfolding for me right now that I've been able to talk about a little bit. Like, one, I think there's the agent has to stay out of this thing emotionally. I, I, what, what we're telling our team and what we're kind of finding out is first off, like your job as the agent is obviously to be in an advisory role and make sure your client doesn't make a silly decision. Sure. Every client's financial risk tolerance changes though and and I, sp- I spoke to an agent in grand rapids michigan today but nick said 0.9 months of inventory they had 0.7 months of inventory right so like wow. this is this isn't something that we're like all like like i think most real estate markets are this way it's why we can have this conversation because this isn't unique yeah. to us i mean our, our group our facebook group is national and it's it seems to be permeating through that group as well like this is coming from everywhere oh absolutely and he, he was talking about so it was interesting because i will tell you and i don't almost don't want to give away like the whole show in one thing but there is there's one thing 
one thing specifically that is cross markets and not being done as a, at a high as level as we think it is. And it's, it's buyers who have the money to do appraisal coverage, or appraisal gap coverage, or appraisal yeah. guarantees, whatever they call in your market. Sure. I will tell you as somebody who just saw 30 offers on a home, there were two that had appraisal guarantees. I spoke to that agent in Grand Rapids, Michigan today. You know, we talked about winning our offers, in, how we won our offers, appraisal guarantees. Yeah. Now the reality is why that's difficult and why it's hard for buyers to understand is not many, the fact that two out of 30 are doing it is not many people have the, the tolerance to, to jump into that and be willing to put up 10, 15, $20,000 if the appraisal comes back short and, yeah. and be able to stomach that. But that's what's winning right now. So, so it's not even the tolerance, it's, it's the mental acceptance of, of they, they feel like they're overpaying for houses, sure. right? And, and we've got in our mindset, if it's listed at this, there, there's something where, where we resist, where we don't wanna pay over market value because we feel like we're getting a raw deal. Yeah. And, but if you go truly look at what, it, what, what free market is, free market is what a willing and able buyer is willing to pay, right? And sure. so, you know, you, you have to understand that, that when, if you are the highest home that is sold in that neighborhood, you now are the trendsetter. Absolutely. And what, will, what, what else will happen? Other homes will start to follow suit. That now becomes the new market value, and that will continue to, to rise up. And hopefully you're not the one playing hot potato. And well, that's you, what I was about to say. The musical back. chairs comes that's, to end at some point. It's this is literally my last 48 hours. Like this, exactly what we're talking about. I finally had one of these deals come completely full circle, and fall apart. Right. So if you guys will indulge me, I'll tell this story real quick because I think it's helpful for some agents. Oh, I wish I could do the can cracking sound. I know, right? I already it's opened mine. That would have been perfect. No. Tell me your story. It's story time. <laughs> All right. So, um, anyways, so so client goes under contract. We go twenty seven thousand dollars over asking price, right? Client guarantees twenty thousand of that. So there's a seven. There's a potential seven thousand dollar difference from the list price, whatever. Appraisal comes back at listing price. So worst fears are recognized, right? There we now have the appraisal is back in play from a termination standpoint. Here locally, it's my understanding that the seller has first right of refusal. The seller has the opportunity to reduce that by $7,000 and the $20,000 for the buyer is still in play. Seller chose, I'm not gonna get into the whole story because it's honestly, there's parts of it that are just absurd, but so we'll focus on the financial part. Seller, ultimately seller does not, decides not to cover that $7,000. Buyer terminates. Through this process though, everything that had happened, all the boxes had been checked. The buyer was taking a $20,000 risk. We told them they were taking a $20,000 risk. Appraisers are forcing you into the corner of saying, look, you wanna pay 25 grand over, you're gonna pay it, right? Appraisers aren't running this, this, this up like, that I've seen at all. So buyers end up deciding that the seven grand is too much. It turns out that these specific buyers weren't really interested in probably buying ever. And the market was a little bit too aggressive for them. So we all decided to part ways and move forward with different relationships. But the reality is what, what had happened is the buyer thought it was a really great idea at the beginning of this to come $20,000 out of pocket. And when that reality hit them, it was way too much to bear. So I think there's also a part of this market that is um, maybe conditioning people to make offers that they probably wouldn't make otherwise. And that's the part of it that is not worrisome so much, but I think agents have to be aware of their clients' risk tolerance more than ever in a market like this. So with that though, so let's say that you're, you've got some, you're, you're newly in the business, right? And how, how are you gonna continue pushing forward? You need to start making money because, sure. because what's happening right now is there's gonna be, there's a contraction on, the, the the ceiling or the limitation is how many homes are available for sale that well, we can yeah. sell, right? Sure. Compared to how many agents are out there. And so someone's getting squeezed. The the agents that that don't know how to set that proper expectation. Sure. So that they can make their clients still feel like, look, I understand that you're you're having to go well above appraisal. You're gonna have to guarantee this. You're gonna have to give everything away in order to win this, but it's worth it. The, the agents that can 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 effectively relay that and 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 still confidence are going to continue to win. I think. Well, of course, absolutely, right. Any time you can, I think this is probably kind of permeates through all of real estate all the time. Is your ability to communicate with your clients and build rapport and 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 give them a vision of what the reality of the market is at any time is always going to be a valuable skill set that I don't think everybody possesses. I think from your story, though, the other thing I picked up too is 
dude, if you're not going to be best, at least try to be second best. Because one of the things that I think is is what have you guys run into this where people like don't even take backup offers oh seriously God, on yes. the buy side? Like, eh, like, like, bro, if I'm not winning the offer, I'm pounding you hard to try and be the backup. You just proved that point why that's so the important. The problem with that, and it's what Nick said when he sat down in here, the problem with that is getting the listing agent on the phone. And here's what I just want to just PSA Man, to listing agents. Fuck you guys. <laughs> Don't let the market allow you to think that you're a bigger deal than you really are. What? Because what's, what's happening, I, look, and I understand. 30, also, 30 first offers of all, in a net sheet is a nightmare. Just not picking up the phone doesn't make you a big deal. That's not a big deal. It doesn't. I, but here's the thing is I will also say to all the agents, all the buyer's agents, do your due diligence prior to like th this is a two-way street so like like my little real estate psa is listing agents do your best to respond to the questions that are reasonable buyers agents do your best to check the mls and the the, the transaction desk and all those other things prior to calling yeah. because what is happening in this market and i will tell you as somebody who like i had a listing i put on the other day and got a ton of offers i got so many absurd phone calls asking for things that just don't matter like 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 do you, I don't know if do I can. You had somebody ask for the sales disclosure, and it was in the MLS, and you're just like, bro, if you're. I, I had a guy send me an offer on a house today that's been under contract for four days, and I just brought him back. I said, did you check the MLS before you sent this offer? Like, there's some of it that's just like you're just wasting your time, the buyer's time. You wasting my time. So not every this. agent deserves well, to get the winning offer. Well, so maybe. it goes back to and what I was trying to parlay this, and is what is what Fox just said, right? Like, to to answer Nick's, I want this show to be inclusive for everybody. But here's the other thing too. This market is great for weeding out people who had no freaking business doing yes. this. And, and, and I will get fatter as other people go hungry from a real estate perspective. That, that will happen. Fat and happy. So it's not, sure. this market, just like this market isn't for every buyer, it isn't for every agent either. Well, and so let me, you know, what Brian said about backup offers. I'm one of those agents I don't believe in backup offers. Oh, dude, 100%. I backup offers. I understand it. Like, in this like, market, they're useless because people aren't turning No, no, like, they're useless. You don't, like, you don't believe in them like ghosts? Because they yes, exist. Yes, well, I understand that. But if I'm the if I'm representing a buyer, I don't like putting backup offers in. There's, there's literally two, no there's, consequence there's, to it. Why wouldn't there's you There's two that? reasons why. Okay. One okay, is, that, is that usually that solidifies the first the first offer right and meaning that what is that listing agent going to do she, she's when gonna, negotiating deal they're going to say we've got a backup offer like, get in line or we're going to boot you either out. either 100%. either crap or get off the pot i use them the same way right but isn't that a good thing for the backup offer no what if the yes. offers are pretty close this is this is where you and no, i because i've is, never tracked the number if the offers are way different Here, that's one thing but if you as, if the offers are really close no i'm going to tell you as someone who again as where we we list a lot of houses. We use those backup offers to make the first offer always stay committed, which is screwing the backup offer because that buyer's there kind of waiting and hoping that, that the first one terminates. Okay, right. and but listen though, let's just say that happens 90% of the time. 10% of the time your backup offer still gets accepted. Yes, but at the same time, is that buyer, is the buyer that's sitting there waiting in second tier position hoping and waiting they get it and well, you can maybe just missing withdraw out. that shit. they can't i understand it but they're hoping they get that one and maybe not seriously looking at other okay so maybe maybe oh, that goes back to the conversation maybe that's a yes. bit of the disconnect in using the backup offer to its full power because the part of this is hey mr buyer we're not we aren't sitting around and waiting because the way i structure a backup offer they got 20 dollars in the game that's yeah. it yeah they've got 20 dollars in we're gonna go keep looking at houses worst case scenario you get under contract another house and then this one pops yeah. free you got to yeah, deliver absolutely. option in earnest, and then we just terminate. The other yeah. problem the is looking at other houses. The other needs problem to be is the serious I'm going to tell you right the now. Backup that, offers should be the, the other one problem. Time. Is at least here in Texas, agents, the listing agents, don't understand how backup offers work. That's they are over here problem. wanting you to deliver full option, full earnest money. Paragraph fifteen, baby. And I'm yeah. like, and I'm like, that's we literally had. I had this conversation with one of my agents yesterday, who the agents like, no, they need to deliver all this. I said, no, absolutely yeah. not, because then they're tying up all that money. Right. Yep. So at the end of the day, it's like that's they don't understand how this works. They wanted them to do inspection during the same time. I was like, nope. I will say, I, OK, so I'm not I definitely don't want to disagree. We're going to pay for an inspection while they were the backup. That's, offer? that's what that's what the list. That's what the listing agent wanted them to do. And that was the expectation. So and, and maybe this market is skewed some because I have seen uh, showing alerts or multiple offer alerts going out from showing time, which is what we hear local use locally where agents are almost saying, like, I got one recently, a house that was priced at 545, and the agent was sending out alerts. It's like, hey, just so you know, this house is at $85,000 above list price, 
right? Like, and, and, and I'm yeah. assuming you can do that with the seller's permission. But regarding yeah. regarding the backup side of it, here's here's where I will disagree. It's just because I've 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 had a lot of success with them overcoming exactly what you're talking about, though, making sure the buyer knows they can keep going out there and looking at homes and also writing in the contract. We are depositing this much now when yeah, we move into first right position. So, we will go right. Yeah. And, and now I agree with you. That doesn't probably work in this market and backup offers are less effective in this market. I would just say as a tool, I love backup offers. They're just not strong. You know what's strong right now? Appraisal guarantees. Yeah, yes. better. Offers. Oh, right. That's it. Right? That's <laughs> well, it. Appraisal guarantees and then and then finding other ways like We've offered paying all of the seller's taxes. That's an interesting one. I have mm. not done that. Mm. So hot, how does... Hot, hot tip right here, because I'm telling you... How does one do go about this? Because I'm intrigued. Is because think of it this way. Provisions? Yeah, you just write in there that... Just that willing to pay the full 21, buyer 21 will, taxes? Yeah, buyer will pay all... Because here's the thing. You're getting... The, you're, you're, the buyer's getting the credits anyway of from the seller for their taxes that yeah, they were paying that's right like here. an off-contract credit. It's cool. I learn something every day on this podcast. I've never used that. I'm going to give that wasn't my idea, Elizabeth Austin. That's pretty solid. Credit on that. Good idea, bro. I have seen some of her posts lately, and she's. I will say, I don't know anybody getting people under contract, under list price, or getting them concessions. I know I'm not one of those people right now. Like I'm the buyers that I'm dealing with right now have to be serious about what we're trying to accomplish, right? Because I'm just. I'll just tell you, I'm not out looking for deals because I just don't think many exist. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting that she's able to use that because I haven't thought about using that at all. That's a super good idea. Yeah. yeah. Paul's like, that's great until you find a tax lien. Paul, you, you can also put exceptions in Is, there. You're, are you can phones put, different than mine? You can I'm put property taxes on there, right? These. So um, you're not paying the tax liens on it. Now, that could be a great idea depending on how much the liens are, right? So yeah. it, look, there's always it, what we're saying here, Paul, is also you got to find the right solutions, yes. right? Think outside the box where... You know, we're still seeing agents. How many of you have? How many times have you seen on the listing side agents are sitting submitting a five thousand dollar over asking price, and you've said, "Hey, we've got thirty offers on this." I will just tell you right now. I've been advising clients like in most situations, we're taking everything, but I'm almost going a ten and five and ten and ten approach. Meaning, if you're not going ten grand over list price and guaranteeing five of it, there's probably no reason to offer. If you're not going ten grand and and, and guarantee, I will tell you right now. I would rather have a ten thousand dollar over appraised or over list price with a full guarantee than 20,000 over appraised value with no guarantee. Yep. Like all day long right now. Because I, I will tell you what I'm seeing on the appraisal side is appraisers are absolutely checking this market. We, so I would rather have the money guaranteed than just risk, maybe we'll get 20 grand over. Because I've seen more appraisals coming short of list price. Because now what's happening is sellers and, and listing agents are hip to the game and they are pushing prices pretty aggressively right now well so I, it's hard to find on paper comps yeah i made a i was i was talking to a homeowner yesterday he he inquired on our website and, and, and i'm seeing a lot of people inquiring just to true to maybe solidify or or justify their price they're paying so we're seeing a lot of home evaluations come in I think, yeah. of people who aren't yeah. who are buying a house yeah. and so he's like no i just closed on this one i'm not interested in selling for the next eight to ten years and so I asked him, I said, what did you pay for it, if you don't mind me asking? And the list price was 349 He paid 370 He offered 371 He's like, here's the shitty thing. I was like, all right, let me listen to this. Yeah. He's like, I wrote an appraisal guarantee, appraisal waiver, guaranteeing all of it. The appraisal came in at 325 Yes. And and that's the thing. There, there is, I'm starting to see a lot of it to where, a, oh my God. to where. That guy had a bad agent. 100%. If you don't write somewhere in there has special to be a on the market, to that if you don't say that it needs to meet, the, it's in the fucking appraisal guarantee, at least in North Texas. It's lying to. Yeah, that you put that as the sales price. It's a dummy. Oh, well, a here's dummy. the thing. We also don't know. Maybe, maybe it, look, it coming into that, and, and that was the only option that he had was buying it. We, we I, I had so, one like that that we, we were priced at 305 Um Homes went under contract for three thirty one. They they checked box one, right? Guaranteeing the yeah. full amount. House came in at two ninety five. They came out of pocket thirty six thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. If they're, happy, if they're happy to do it, they're happy to do that's, it. I mean, and that's why I say is. every yeah. client's risk tolerance is different. You can't advise everybody the same. That is true. We tend to, and this might be where agents struggle a little bit as far as actionable advice. We tend to project our own feelings about things onto other people mm -hmm. sometimes. So, like, the way that you feel about a deal might not be the way that your clients do. Yeah. And, and, like, don't, you know what I mean? Like, you, you need to start to 
to, 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 to dig, dig a little deeper on their mindset and advise them uh, according to what their goals are, not necessarily what you would do in that particular situation. But how are you helping? So, again, you, you're you lead generating and you're calling your sphere. you got leads coming in. How are you getting them off the fence right now? Because there's two there's two multiple there's there's on both sides of the fence seller and buyer the objections are on the sell side like like i don't want to sell because where am i going to go right and then on the buy side i think i'm just going to stay renting because i don't really want to pay I, i'm going to wait for the market to crash right <laughs> that's always like i would just say Which, so, like that's just the silliest one for it, me it, it is but when you start seeing the when you start seeing the run-up that we've had Right, and it starts to happen more. That that conversation starts to come because what are they looking at? They're looking at how ab absurd and insane some of these prices are going for. They're not wrong. No, they're not. But that is that is that is probably one of the top objections that you're hearing is like on a buy side, like I want to wait for the crash or I don't want to get into a bidding war, so I'm just going to stay renting. The, the I don't want to get into a bidding war thing is legit, right? Like if you don't want to get in bidding war in, in DFW, seriously, just re-sign your lease and chill like i'm just going to tell you right now like i'm, I'm not even trying to like yeah. act like that's not the case in almost every scenario you are going to be up against somebody right yeah that might be the case like we're not gonna be mad if you don't buy right no, now. i'm not going, going kind of anywhere i'll help you yeah. next year i will say so two <laughs> things i will tell you this to, to, to speak to just what is happening in the market right now on a very real level there is a um there is a book called boomerang by michael lewis that is about the financial collapse of different countries over time a lot of parallels to what happened in Italy a long time ago to what's happening now. Regardless, um, I'll tell you, dude, the secret is work the other side. Like, I don't want to be like like super tough guy over here because I had like nothing to do with this at all. We have an amazing group of people that we work with and just an incredible team. But we took 20 listings last month. And it's a lot easier to get buyers under contract when you have an influx of buyers because a lot of them are coming from your listings. If you're struggling to get people under contract, work the other side. And I get that that sounds super simplistic, but the reality is this. If you ask yourself, like, we talk about this all the time. I fundamentally don't believe real estate agents really work hard enough. And when I say that, I say that, like, dude, like, we, we might be great representatives of our clients a lot and stuff. But as far as, like, actually getting up, working your ass off, and building a business every day... The three of us, we have a pizza delivery guy and two bartenders here. The only thing we ever did right in our lives was work really fucking hard to build these businesses, and I don't think that everybody does that. The only thing that we did differently and have done differently and will continue to do differently is when it got hard on the buy side, I put it out there that I said, look, here's X. We did a listing competition that was a cash prize. Everybody got revved up, and the cash prize didn't matter. It was more the culture. We built a culture around going after listings. Yes, you're going to handle objections. You're going to have people that say they don't want to fucking sell right now, all this type of shit. Guess what? Dig deeper, bro. Like, it just is what it is. If you're anything, if you're anything, if you're, if you're a professional athlete, right, you probably treat the preseason different than the fucking Super Bowl. This is now Super Bowl time. Get up earlier. Work harder. I don't want to hear your excuses. People are selling houses. I will just say too that I would I would venture to say if you think that every seller knows what's going on in this market, I can prove to you you're not working hard enough because anytime you talk to old expireds or talk to an expired who is six months old and for somehow they just list back in October and they miss this whole market or whatever, they're like, it's just really not a great market to sell. And I'm like, look, I don't know who's telling you that. Yeah. But whatever data you have, and I'm not saying that in October or last August when you listed it was a great market sell. I would just say if you're a real estate agent who has yourself convinced that sellers don't want to sell because of the market, you're not calling enough people because if you would, you would find a lot of a ton of yeah. conversations with people who are not have no clue, clue. what's going I on. I will tell you right now, I got here to the office today at seven forty five this morning and two people under the age of twenty five beat me here and they were already ready to make calls. So shout out to Joanna Rodriguez and Ashley Vega. If you ain't doing that, believe that we got people doing that. So if you think that we're doing something special and secret and all this type of stuff, now nah, we're just getting here earlier. So man. that that's the point of it, right? So most of these ones that are struggling at getting sellers or just getting clients in general, they're not they're not making the phone calls, mm -hmm. right? And it just and, got a little harder, man. Yeah, the mountain and, got a little steeper. And the harder part with making phone calls is not the objections as well. It's like less people are answering the phone. So what do you have to do? Now you've got to double, triple the amount of calls that you're making. No one wants to hear that. Right, that's Here's the deal. If 
less people are answering the phone, guess what you now have? More time to make more calls because you're not tied up with as many conversations. Well, then, and then yes, <laughs> true, true. And, but then you have to be ultra prepared that when someone answers the phone, because how many times have you sat there dialing and you're you're in that day? Well, surprise when they pick up. Yeah. And then someone, hello? And you're like, oh, shit. Hold on. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, and dude. you're like, wait, who am I calling time, right now? All the time right? I used to do that. Right? Or I'm, I'm calling and I'm on another website. And I'm like, what, the, what is their name? Like, yeah. who am I calling? Like, uh, and, and you fumble around, right? I used to do, I'm laughing because that was like my life, man, 100%. That's what they're doing, yeah. right? And it, look, if you're making, if you're at least making phone calls, you're at least one step ahead, sure, right? And so then you look at your KPI metric, your your leading indicator, which is going to be the number of dials you make, right? And then you follow up with a text message, then yeah. you follow it up with an email, then you just make sure that you you if you ran through your list. Guess what? Run through it again. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you talk to 100% of those people, which is probably not the case, uh, yeah. it, not probably. It's no way. It, <laughs> well, I'm going to say. Prob- it is I mean, I don't. Decidedly not. Well, what yeah. list are they calling? I'm not going to. I'm not right. going to go with the assumption. Not the that, first time through. Yes. I mean, dude, but it's it's it's, it's, it's every. Pre- I do, oh, you're trying to say pivot, Fox? You're saying hello, and uh, I'm saying you're sorry. You're saying hello in Russian, Fox. I think you meant to say pivot. Pivot. Yeah. Pivot. 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 <laughs> I know. Uh, it's, it's, it's like anything. Just like seriously, if you're not, if it's not calls, do something else at a higher level, right? If you analyze your business on a very deep level, right? I am, I am living proof of this. I don't do anything at a hundred percent. I just know it. I always have room for improvement. I always have room for growth. I always have room to, to 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 find the next you know level or whatever. The guy, the people out there saying it's too hard. There's too you know, it's, you know there's not enough people want to sell. It's all that type of stuff. Just ask yourself. Look, if it's not phone calls, what else are you do in a high level? How many, like, what does your database look like right now? How many coffee dates are you going on? What are you doing to deepen your relationships? The reality is there's a lot of stuff that we could be doing all the time that we don't for a lot of different reasons. Part of it is fear, right? Part of it is, is, is you know, quite frankly, part of it is laziness. Part of it is, is hesitancy about all these different things. But the reality is it is not like, you know, let's just take North Texas, 100,000 real estate agents in North Texas probably. It is not like 100,000 people were freaking running and gunning at 100% and then all of a sudden this market got tough. No, for the most part, everybody already had room to improve and now they're 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 going, "Oh, this is really hard. You already could have been doing more." Yeah. yeah. So well, the I, simple answer is things were already hard, they got harder. Look, let's look at let's it's not I wouldn't call everyone lazy. There's going to be a select group. This but, is, yeah, never right? applies to everybody. But well, and even the ones that we think that are lazy. I think most agents think they're trying very yes. hard. Yes. Yes, but I would say the number one is fear, right? Yeah, number I was one 100%. is it, it's it's fear of of that rejection, that call. They're they they, you know, they're rejecting themselves before they even make the call, right? But all right, let's say that you're not going to do that. Well then, are you cutting up videos every single day? Are you going Facebook Live every single day? Well, no, you've got a fear of what you look like and sound like on camera. I'm gonna tell you right now, if that's the case, then I shouldn't be on this shit, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that, Nick, Nick doesn't even have one of the cool cameras yet. Yeah, <laughs> like that's the thing. Brian over here talking about how good he looks in the new one. I'm like, mm-hmm. I, know. I, I still got this old one over here. I'm responsible for the third camera <laughs> and I may or may not have went and raced go-karts on Saturday night and I may or may not have had some drinks after that and the camera may or may not still be in Dallas. <laughs> Somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> so, but that, that's the point is like, you know, you're not going to make calls, but you don't want to do videos. Then what, what are you going to do? Right. It, I guarantee you, I could not make calls and I could go do Facebook lives three times a day and I'll still have more clients than those, those, those agents. Right. I there, agree. there, I can, I actually, I can use it in another business model. There, there's a lady that I had on at the beginning of the year named Jesse Lee Ward. Right. Jesse Lee Ward sells you know uh, Fox on here said privet she sells prove it or something like that it's that ketones multi-level marketing yeah. and she goes live on Instagram Facebook goes on TikTok, and and her business was built on social media yeah. and she's making mm-hmm. I mean she's killing it like three four million dollars a year That's and it's bad. all from the social media going live building that following that brand and and she's documenting her sales cycle her process of selling this little this little powder and most of her videos is her opening up a water bottle pouring the powder and shaking it up drinking it and telling what it tastes like and saying do you want to get your free sample and then people order and then she follows up and then guess what in the multi-level marketing side then she's going back do you want to be a distributor 
That sounds good. Are they? Look how think, easy are they pretty is. good drinks? I don't know. I'm I had it's, not, it's all right. <laughs> None of those powdery drinks are really like super great. They all taste like so. diet Pepsi. And you usually get a chunk like in there too. Yeah. The, the bottom line is all about finding a way, right? Like we, as this, as an industry as a whole, we have certain lanes that are kind of proven, and then everything else is just finding a way, right? And, and sometimes finding a way is just working harder or whatever it is, right? Like getting out of our own head, stop being fearful. It's just finding. A, I'll give you. An, I'll give you a real super bougie example and, and dumb guy example. Like, I was about to go to lunch with Lady, our operations director today, who's also my wife, and I went home. Wait, you're dating you're with I one know. of the people here? I'm also HR. HR. I'm gonna tell you a secret. I'm fucking her too. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is why we're not going to get to 100,000 down. We're going to do a greatest hits we'll roll. We'll never make real money. At some on point show. in the future, we're going to no. do a greatest hits you know, roll. There's, a, there's a podcast that really. Clip A number one. There's a podcast that, that just passed 100,000 downloads. We should have already passed that by now. By, you know, so go download us, leave yeah, us a review. Go download we're a very podcast. select group of people yeah, who watch and this. So show. now. I think we've just lost yeah. some downloads. She's because. my wife, guys, if I didn't make that clear enough <laughs> on the last 97 <laughs> episodes of this that we've done. Anyway, I came home to pick her for lunch, and she was getting around like 20 minutes, right? I slept in. Usually doesn't happen, but I did. I didn't work out this morning. I think that she, she was in the bathroom getting ready, and she heard me like moaning and grunting. I think she thought I was like doing something. <laughs> I was doing push-ups. <laughs> more and more off the I'm going off. I'm going to Jesse's birthday today. Is today your birthday? Yeah, this is just an anecdote. This example. Is yesterday. Jesse's birthday, or, or his birthday dinner is today, I should say. I didn't work out this morning. I don't have time later. We're pretty much going right to Jesse's birthday almost after this. I had 20 minutes. I was like, bro, let's just bang out some push-ups. I couldn't have done anything else. It's just like, and like, I'm not trying to be like tough guy, Brian. I didn't do a lot. I did some. What I'm saying is that just you have the time. You have the resources. You have everything. Find a way, dude. It's Kelderman's a perfect example. Of this. this dude, this motherfucker does push-ups in the office all the time. It's kind of weird. He'll just <laughs> drop down and start doing push-ups. But you know what? He finds a way. And he's 42 years old. He's in better shape than I am. And he does push-ups during conversation in the office sometimes. Because you know what? We're busy people, and we just make it happen. We just find a way. And sometimes it's weird. And sometimes, it, how does that translate to all the other businesses out there, all the other agents out there? Just find a way dude right, right there's ways we are doing business still i'm looking at our whiteboard right now it's got 42 mother effing pendings on it pretty cool we're also dumb people so if we can do it <laughs> you can do it too it's just the, it, you're executing the game plan that's it yeah. right and then you got your 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 agents to follow the game plan but i also think that game plan kind of constructs itself over time it starts with just getting up and working your ass off and right. a lot of times it starts with being lost but just trying to move forward. Yes. And that's where that fear that you were talking about comes yep. in. A lot of us, when we're lost and we don't know what the next step is, we get afraid and we just kind of shut down. You just got to you just gotta find, do something. Make a call. Knock a door. Shoot a video. Move forward. I'll also say one of the things that you can do before you get the motivation to do that is just talk to somebody that's also in the same industry you're in, right? Like, I think this is where, like, you know, Brian works with his spouse, obviously. <laughs> But like, if, if your spouse isn't in the industry, they are not the best sounding board for you. And, and, and I think it is important to remember the mentality it takes to get through this market. I will say 13, 14, and 15, for me, the inventory wasn't so low, but the difficulty, I was a heavy buyer's agent and getting buyers yeah. under contract was so hard, right? Like I, and I couldn't take listings because I wasn't calling any listings and I was nervous about going to their living room because I didn't have any experience, right? There were all these things that I didn't really know how to do. And so for the agents that are feeling that, I think it's really important, one, to vocalize that there is, yeah. you know, no matter what proverb you read or, or, or what you go to, there is something about bringing your fears to the light that does help you overcome them a little bit. And I think if you have a conversation with other people that are struggling with the same thing, you'll find that a you're not alone, which there's just there's just some lightening of the mood in that alone. But also secondarily, you, if you have enough of those conversations and you make an effort, you'll find out stuff like we just found out. The three of us hang out at least for this hour every single week, yeah. right? And typically have a million side conversations. And the tax thing is something that is, is actually something I can implement in my business that just came from us talking, right? Like yeah. people don't realize this show is just normal conversation that happens in front of a camera. Like yeah. it's the same it's shit. This is kind of just how we always talk. Yeah. yeah. You know, but you're right there. I, th I think that, that there's... Two things like that, that, that there's like a layer of honesty that you need to have with yourself and vulnerability, right? Yeah, and that's something that I think all three of us do pretty well. And maybe I'm just kind of putting the pieces together here now on the show that like that might be one ingredient in kind of moving forward and finding some success. Is like, don't be afraid to 
to know that like I'm scared or I don't know what to do or like and, 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 and surround yourself with people that are okay with that too. You'll grow and learn, but but you you made a perfect point about the spouse. Like if you just have somebody in your life that you're coming and dumping all your shit on because it's not you're, really their you know, problem either, right? And they're not probably going to be very helpful. But yeah. if you surround, like this is like I got into Nick's world when when he and I were in a different stratosphere as far as our businesses and all that type of stuff, and he was so humble and unbelievably giving as far as his knowledge and information but not only that his the, the emotional side right like understanding that he went through a lot of the shit that i went through we go through the same shit nowadays right and like a lot of the conversations that we have are not about us talking about how amazing our businesses are most of the conversations we have are like about shit that's going wrong that it's we're trying to crash yeah, yeah that we're trying to lean on each other and get some help dude like we are constantly in give me some help mode you know what i mean and that maybe is where a lot of agents need to get more comfortable i think so asking for help is very very difficult fox says like be okay with failure we, brian fox and i actually went to lunch today and we were talking about this exactly like i just think there's a level of failure or change that comes with every transition to the next level and and now that I'm kind of on what I feel like is the third kind of level of my life, I'm less worried about some of the things I used to be worried about, but I'm more worried about the things coming up and maintaining where I'm at. There is an aspect of it that like failure is not the scary part. The scary, I would say the anxiety part is knowing failure is coming it and just, not really understanding how it's going to hit you, right? Yeah. Like who in your life might leave unexpectedly, yeah. well, right? Like what part might fall apart? Like, Look, and it's also where as we get older, I don't have the same energy to handle that failure and if it's and if it's devastating enough i don't feel like i'd have that future energy to rebuild doesn't that depend like what the venture is though i, because feel, I, the I, same I, I feel that right there are certain things that i'm like no i'm tossing that in the trash right yeah, yeah. there's other things right like if you were I'll, I'll use a very practical example there's probably some real estate things that i just wouldn't do anymore but there's some stuff that brian and i are doing with like our video output that i'm like willing to put pedal to the metal on yeah. right because it's a new idea it's exciting well, the realist, there's some real estate things that were new, exciting ideas that that I've, I'm disinterested in now, but were the yeah. bright, shiny objects back then, right? That now I'm like, this isn't really a part of my business yeah. anymore, you know? So I think I yeah. think understanding that it evolves a little bit too is yeah probably it's part the of the growth human process. adaptability part of it is yeah. is you, like I, I i would yeah that's a perfect example like when i used to carry around my little mail like not even mailers because i couldn't afford to mail them my little satchel of newsletters right i thought that was the most innovative shit yeah. on earth bro. Satchel, essentially a 19, the satchel of the newsletter you were a 1950s oh. paper boy it's all it was <laughs> dude i was a legitimate paper boy in my early real estate career i print out two thousand newsletters a month i carried them in a satchel and I'd hand deliver. I was like, nobody's doing this. Knowing Brian, Nowadays, I bet the satchel was leather and it was from Fossil. It's yeah. brown. It's, it's I still have it, dude. By, By the, the way, way still like, remember it, when I got it, fucking super scared on Halloween because that ghost jumped out on the door and I dropped all those newsletters <laughs> on that person's doorstep? I just ran away. By the way, we're we're 40 minutes into this and we forgot to make mention. This is my fault as an opening. Oh, man. As an opening, right? Today's show sponsored by Sphere Rocket VA. We're coming to you live from the Sphere Rocket VA studio. 40 here minutes in. in. So we, got more, we got more viewers than we did at minute one. Yeah, it's so, just worked out better. So Sphere Rocket VA, look, if you're looking to leverage out your business, right? Whether you're in the real estate business, you're a loan officer, you're, you're a business owner in general, leverage is going to help you grow faster. It's going to be, help you become more profitable. It's going to help you focus on the things that, that brings in the most amount of money and buys back your time. So connect with Justin Nelson at Sphere Rocket VA yeah. and talk with him about, about utilizing his virtual assistants. It's huge in our world, by the way. Every single one of our businesses would be wind dire straits without our business. And the podcast, the group here, we have we will be having our own dedicated virtual assistant yeah. for this right so not only not only are is is he a sponsor we're also clients what is mm -hmm. that what is that a, is that the hair plug thing yeah, or whatever not it only is? i'm not only the president i'm i'm a member i'm a member yeah. that, that was the hair club for men hair club for men yeah so so it's the same thing as like look we're we're clients of justin's he's a sponsor of this show at sphere rocket va their virtual assistants are amazing and he's cutting out the middleman Right, yeah. so it's not like you're going to some of these other where you're paying 10, 12, 15 bucks an it's hour. A huge markup no. for nothing, yeah. No, he's the recruiter. Then they help with the training side. Yep. 
Yep. So go over to sphererocketva.com. Um, eventually, you'll start seeing some some scrollers across the screen here. We'll get yeah. better at making sure that we introduce our sponsor here. Um, We're starting with the cameras. Yeah. We'll get Nick's next week, and then after that, maybe we'll do titles or graphics. We might get a Tyrannosaurus on here. Here's the Who thing: knows? is if you've just convinced yourself somehow that we're like more skilled than you are, honestly, just watch the show for about eight weeks, and you'll find out that we are just implementing and stumbling and fumbling and figuring it out. Just and we're just not making else. a lot of apologies for what we're doing. Just and that is everybody else. Here we are 97 episodes later. Right. So Brian Fox said, be okay with failure. We failed Justin at the beginning. Now we just made up now for we that. We made up for it. And, and we're okay with that. Yeah. And I will tell you that even from last week from that show, he's, he's talking to a couple of people that are looking nice. to hire you know, utilize the service. Here's the reality. Like, I will also say that, like, I have no problem bringing on this one thing because A, it took us 96 episodes to do it. B, we use it all at a really, really super high level. And a lot of the stuff that we talk about, like, the reality is a lot of the stuff we talk about on the show does require leverage. Like, there is a part of the, the, the agents who have literally zero leverage. They're looking at what we're talking about being like, well, of course they're saying that. They've got these other things. Yeah, dude, you should figure out a way to get a transaction coordinator. Yeah, it's dope right? as hell. Like, <laughs> it makes it, because you know what? I'm going to do it 100% the second this show ends gonna be in cancun mindset until sunday at about yeah, 3 p.m i was right? in cancun mindset since three o'clock central yeah. standard yeah. time so. i did come in at about 10 30 this morning and look <laughs> at brian and i was like i'm on vacation so like, yeah, I was like so but too. here's the thing is and now does that mean i'm gonna have to do nothing no my computer's going with me, my phone's going with you it just means that i'm going to have leverage to hand stuff off to so we're not again we're not selling you anything we don't use uh, on a regular basis yeah i want to get your thoughts on this as we wind down where do we go from here as far as the market? Only down. Less houses, more money. It's a really abrupt and um, terrible here's answer. Here's the thing is I think I think we're gonna move into a natural uptick in inventory because of spring, right? Do I think there is still a spring mindset. Yes okay, and no. so yes and no. I, I agree it's with not, It's not gonna relieve everything, yeah. but it's there. Yes and no. What is yes and no? Well uh, so I, I agree with you that we're going to have an uptick in uh, uptick in inventory, but here's the thing. The demand is so hungry that we're matter. we're not going to see no. it. It'll, right? Yeah, I guess. That's and, true. and and the look, numbers will go higher, yeah, but you won't see more inventory. Of course. So we're not we're still going to hover around that one maybe one one months of inventory, and we are already starting to see a pullback in in, in buyer applications on the lending side because rates went over three percent. I'm like, so, are you, so yeah, crazy. but it's all relative. Dude. So it's relative, but here's the thing: that is kicking out the people that have no money. Now. Go look at the 96 offers and everything else. There's still that's going to be a small a small percentage that if they're getting out of the game because rates went over three percent from 2.75, they again they probably weren't going to win in this market in the exactly. first place. Yeah. So they weren't they weren't part of the the demand issue. Do you think that buyer fatigue would play a, a factor at some point? Just people just tired of bidding wars and yes. paying. Yeah. Yes, there will be some of that. I, 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 I think that's I think that's a rotating thing though, because the thing about buyer fatigue is the buyers have to enter the market, get Whoa. fatigued. The more buyers leave. that quit, the more buyers get their offers. Then more accepted. buyers come <laughs> in. It's like right? a like, game. It is. It is. It, so <laughs> I, th I think the main thing you can take away from the show today is buyers are easy to get, sellers are where the gold's at, appraisal clauses are winning. If you have somebody who is just riding at list price in some of these markets we're seeing, they're probably not gonna have a ton of success. And that doesn't mean that you need to dump them. It means you need to set proper expectations up front and make sure that whatever is happening, whatever's happening for um, those buyers specifically, you need to make sure it falls within their ability to handle it. So I think, I think inventory levels start creeping up when agents start overpricing homes to a point where we don't see the bidding wars yes right we start to see start looking here's going to be the telling sign go monitor price reductions in your marketplace dude that honestly is that, that you talk about those those like leading and lagging indicators i think price reductions are probably the first thing that this can be the first piece of data that we see that indicates the market's doing something different yeah that's true well I'm gonna... <laughs> That was so valuable. There, that was a weird, awkward sound. It was. I've, I've Sometimes just... Matt says something, but he makes eye contact with Nick, who I think is going to take the next uh, thing here. And then look, I purposely did that. I could, you just yeah, let me hang in there. True. Well, yeah. all I know is that my business is going to be great as long as I'm still banging our ops director. Jesse, take us out. Thanks for watching the show today. Make sure if you're watching this on Facebook, you head over to our group, the only real estate group we're being a part of, so you can watch the extended conversation. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And if you listen on the Apple Podcast, leave us a review. We'd really like it. So just do it. Do it.
do that over there. Go to this one, then go to that one. Thanks.